Welcome to this week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast, where experienced professionals, entrepreneurs, and community leaders based in Kingston-upon-Thames are invited on to share their story with us. I'm your host, Amir Rochalima. This week's episode of the Inside Kingston podcast is brought to you by Holland Hahn & Wills, a financial planning and wealth management firm based in Kingston-upon-Thames. Holland Hahn & Wills specialises in retirement planning for senior professionals and successful business owners. Visit hhw-uk.com to start feeling more relaxed and confident about your financial future. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. I'm joined today by Claire Wilshire. Claire is the founder of Dr. Me, a company that supports women to feel energised, strong and in control of their life by focusing on their health. What's unique about Claire is how she uses her own experience, having herself suffered with chronic fatigue syndrome, to provide her clients with the tools to ensure they can excel at living their life to the full. And be sure to listen to the end, where Claire shares with us some tips that you can implement in your life to get you feeling healthier and more energised. So whether you're interested in knowing more about the world of health coaching, or would like to know more about what it takes to run a successful independent business, then I hope you enjoy this episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Welcome, Claire Wilshire, to the Inside Kingston podcast. Claire, I'm really excited about this conversation because, well, I think probably especially over these last 12 to 14 months that we've been in and out of lockdown here in the UK, a lot of people, including myself, have been sort of listening a bit more to their own body, as it were. They've been paying attention to their health, their mental well-being. And therefore, I think that our listeners can learn a lot from your expertise in this area. But um, to kick off this conversation, I'd like to go back in time, if that's okay. So, Claire, where did you grow up? So, thank you for having me, firstly. Um, I grew up in a town called Abingdon, which is just on the outskirts of Oxford. Um, I lived there... Up until I was 16, um, went to the local schools there. And then for my A-levels, I went off to a boarding school to uh, really specialise in sport. So, um, yeah, I spent two years at boarding school before then deciding that I was going to follow my dream of becoming a PE teacher and then went to Exeter University to study sports science. Oh, wow. So uh, excellent. So you went to to Exeter and, and studied sports science. And that, of course, is an interesting degree in and of itself, I think, isn't it? Because it, it, it encompasses quite a lot of health work in, in the body of study that you need to go through. It does indeed. And actually, I think I've probably used it more in the development of Dr. Me than I did while, whilst I was doing all my 16 years of PE teaching. So um, I'm not quite sure that's entirely true. But I've really, really sort of gone back and thought about the sports psychology side of things, the nutrition elements and um, modules that I did there. So yeah, it's really drawn on that for me. Very interesting. So I think you mentioned that a PE teacher, is that what you, was what was your career before you started your business? Yeah, so I did a three-year sports science degree and then did a one-year um, PGCE, which enabled me to be able to teach. And then, I, yeah, I did. I became a PE teacher and taught. Um, I've taught in many, many different schools now. Um, my husband, um, I met at university and we uh, got married fairly young because he was joining the RAF. And so to enable me to live with him in a married course, we actually needed to be married. So at the five, or the very young age of 23, we walked, or I walked down the aisle. And um, yes, we had our first house over in East Anglia at RAF Huntington. Oh, well, so I bet you've you, just because of the nature of, of your husband's role, you've probably moved around the UK or maybe even abroad for, for quite a bit. Yeah, I think we're on house number 11 now. So wow. they've all been in uh, in the UK apart from one, which was in Germany. Oh, so wow. um, loved living over there. It's great fun. Fantastic. So bringing this conversation to the present, could you tell us a little bit about your business today? Certainly. So I set up a company called Dr. Me a couple of years ago. Um I was in a school in Kent teaching down there and I said to the head teacher, I said, oh, Sophie, I'd love to take the whole school off timetable and I would love to be able to deliver this health week to them. And um, she 
within about 30 seconds, she said, absolutely, yes, as long as it's safe and as long as it's not going to cost me too much money, go for it. So I set about deciding what to include in this health week. I got doctors in, dentists in, they tried golf, we did a military fitness day, they did archery, we did cookery lessons, we did all sorts. And it was sort of health, whole encompassing with the whole school. The kids loved it because it was different. The teachers loved it because I planned everything and they didn't need to do any teaching that week. And the parents loved it because the kids were coming home really enthused each day. So it's a real rip-roaring success. So we were there for two years. And so I did it again the second year, but I was very mindful that I wanted to focus on different elements of health. So it wasn't just this repeated thing. So once again, got in guest speakers and did all different sort of uh, bits and pieces with them. And again, it was a real success. So much so that when I left the school um, in Kent to go up to North Yorkshire for our next posting, um, the teacher gave, or the head teacher gave me a leaving gift and it was a book called The Small Business Startup Workbook. So why is she giving me this? I've been a PE teacher all my life. I, I know nothing about business. This is insane. And I suddenly thought, well, my husband's going into a very busy job. Both my children are going away to boarding school because otherwise they have to change schools very, very frequently. And I thought, well, what's the worst that's going to happen? If it doesn't work, whenever we move again, I can just become a PE teacher and re-identify myself again. So it didn't take me that long to think that actually I was going to give this business malarkey a bit of a go. And I set up a business called Dr. Me. Now, this is an acronym for Diet, Resilience, Mindset and Exercise. And it's my sort of, it's the underpinning belief of mine that actually health is wholly incorporated. We need to look at our physical health. We need to look at our mental health and we need to work on all different areas of our body and mind to enable us to be the healthiest and just the best versions of ourselves. It's not about going on a crash diet or it's not about going on some crazy sort of marathon running training schedule. You've got to also think about how you sleep, how you hydrate, how you view the world, how you view yourself. And all of these factors are so important in making us to become the best versions of ourselves. I like that a lot, Claire. And in fact, one of the things that struck me as really interesting and a thread that I want to pull with you further in this conversation is exactly what you mentioned there, which uh, coincidentally very much mirrors the frame of mind, the, the mindset that we employ in our financial planning business, which is nothing to do with your field of work, but we also consider that there is no one product or no one investment that's going to solve anything for for anybody. It's a collection. It's a holistic approach to the collection of individual things in one's personal financial world that gives them that peace of mind and that clarity. And what you're saying there about your business for me is brilliant. And I, if you wouldn't mind, I I would love for you to expand a little bit more on that uh, for our listeners on the, the, the four letters of that acronym. So Could you tell us just a little bit more about how you think of diet, how you think of resilience, how you think of mindset and how you think of exercise in the way they complement each other with your with your services? Absolutely. I'd love to. I love speaking about anything health related. So um, let's start at the beginning. So diet. Um, diet actually is Latin for way of life. So I did. I, I'm denied whether to word, use the word diet, but it had a D, which fitted in nicely with the acronym, um, but also it's something that people can relate with. My only problem with it is, is that it's sort of very restrictive or people view diets as being restrictive, whereas I don't tell people not to eat things. I sort of introduce new things and get them to substitute. So um I'm a prime example here. I love cooking. I love eating. And I love the odd glass of wine and a gin and tonic every now and again. I'm by all means, you know, I'm not perfect, but I view those things as treats. So I don't have them every day. I certainly don't eat chocolate and crisps every day, but I do eat them every now and again because I view it as being, you know, life is too short. And it's that whole everything in moderation sort of um, scenario. Mm. So diet for me, I try and promote people to try and eat the rainbow. So that is eating something fresh every day. That is orange, red, yellow, blue, green, purple sorry blue purple green and white Mm -hmm. so if you can eat a portion which is about um a palm full of food 
of each of those six colors every day, then you'll be doing your, your gut microbiome and your digestive system absolutely the world of good. And by doing that, that creates the most amount of energy it can for you. And it also enhances your immune system, which are two things that uh, after the last year, we could all do with a bit absolutely. more. Absolutely. So moving on to resilience. Um, So resilience traditionally is your ability to bounce back from adverse situations. I've linked sleep to resilience because there's been so much research done of late that sleep is just so vital for you. In fact, we've been designed to sleep a third of our lives and quite often people devalue sleep. They think they're better than sleep. They just think that it's not important, but actually the science behind it shows that if you could package sleep up, it would be a wonder drug. People, you know, the things that happen within us whilst we're asleep, it's a cleaning process, both physically and mentally. It's a sifting process. It's a memory storing process. It helps wounds heal and sore muscles. It um, builds our immune system. It does so, so much sleep for our bodies that I am really make it a priority with my um, clients. Um, moving on to mindset. Um, with mindset, I very quickly realized that you can have the most amazing diet, you can eat the best food, you can um you can sleep really well and you can exercise really well. But if your mind isn't in the right place and you don't, if you're stressed out, then the effects of all the other good things that you're doing to you yourself aren't going to help you at all so actually to sort out your mindset and your your viewpoint of the world and really seeking for the positives and looking at how to build your self-esteem and all those wonderful other things that we can do to enhance our self-belief and our self-confidence and putting ourselves out there that plays a huge huge role in people's health so Moving on to the last section, which is exercise. Now, obviously, this is one that's very close and dear to my heart. Um, Exercise, I reframe as movement because not everybody likes to exercise. People don't like to put on lycra and go out and run in front of people. And I get that. Um, We all like different things. But movement and exercise is just so, so important to us. And I think we don't realize how important it is until we can't do it. So I mentioned to you that I was at Exeter University and unfortunately when I was there, I suffered from ME or chronic fatigue syndrome. So I had a couple of years where I was actually really poorly and even a simple conversation like this would have left me exhausted for the next couple of days. And I found myself sort of crawling up the stairs to bed at night because I couldn't have the energy to walk. So I know what it feels like not to have enough energy to exercise. And now I do it because I find that I'm just celebrating that I can. I love getting out and I feel entirely blessed to be living right on Richmond Park's doorstep Um, and having that ability just to go out and move my body and know that I'm doing myself good and both physically and mentally. There's so many health benefits to exercise. In fact, um, somebody said, I read a quote recently and it was by um, Lazarus, Dr. Lazarus, And he said to choose not to exercise is the biggest mistake you can make because it does um, count. It goes, it stops or inhibits about 26 chronic illnesses by moving your body. So obviously being a PE teacher, exercise and movement is really close to my heart. But what I love about it is that there's such diversity out there. There's nobody saying you've got to go for a run. You'd probably get just as many health benefits from sort of giving your, your garden a good dig over or, you know, quite energetically hoovering around your house it doesn't have to be the traditional I must go to the gym and I must wear lycra sort of mindset that's it and what I really like about that Claire is you know I'm sure that our listeners can follow those four different uh, components that you've mentioned there and described they can follow along with you and think you know what absolutely I, I, I have been at my best or I have felt really well with myself when I'm eating well, when I'm doing some form of exercise or intentional movement, when I've got like a good mindset, there are good things happening in my life, or when I found myself thinking of the obstacle as the way and being resilient against things that perhaps have just obstacles and things that have gotten in the way and I've managed to overcome them. 
even if it is with a simple, you know, today I need a good night's sleep. Yeah, tomorrow, yeah, yeah I need a good night's sleep again. You, you can follow that logically. You just think about, you know, anybody can think about their own sort of life circumstances and think, yeah, absolutely. When those components are calibrated, I feel good. So for the benefit of our listeners, could you perhaps just give us some tips uh, and it could be on any of those components or all, just some tips that um, you you think one can implement on their own and, and start feeling healthier and a little more energized? So we'll go through each one again. I think it's probably the logical way to do this. So as I said at the beginning or a little while ago, with the diet, my advice is to eat the rainbow. So you are trying to eat something plant-based. So some sort of vegetable, seed, nut, um, fruit, that sort of thing of each of the different colors of the rainbow because our bodies work if we eat a really nice diverse range of food um, I'm not saying you need to be vegetarian or vegan or anything like that I'm just saying make sure you do get those fresh bits within you because they're great for providing energy for providing immunity and they're great for keeping everything regular as well I also advise to hydrate so quite we all know that we should be drinking water but quite often people forget we should be aiming for about 1.2 liters of water every day which is about eight glasses depending on the size of the glass um it's the cheapest and easiest way to improve your health, I believe. Um, and it's just finding a way to remember to do that. So it might be that you keep a tally chart next to your sink in the kitchen. It might be that you set a reminder on your phone every hour to get up and walk and get a drink. It might be that you eat your hot drinks with a glass of water. Or you might buy one of these um, sort of bottles. I did this for somebody I know recently and it's really encouraged them to drink more water. The ones that have the time sort of slots down the side and even something as simple as that can can make you drink more water. I do say that water is the best that you can have. Um, if you don't like drinking water, because I know there are lots of people who don't, you can add a slice of lemon or frozen lemon or frozen blueberries or raspberries or something just to mix it up a little bit. Um, if you do have to have squash, then just make sure it's the sugar-free version. Um, but yeah, water is really key. Um, with sleep, I would recommend people to make sure they prioritize their sleep because it is so amazingly good for our bodies. But um, our sleep routine actually starts in the morning because our bodies work so cyclically. What happens is um, our bodies prepare for sleep at different rates in different ways. If we can get outside in the morning, what that does, it resets our circadian rhythm, which allows our body to keep following this cyclical process. So um, when we get up in the morning, it's really important to get outside and just even if it's for 10 minutes, just to get a bit of a vitamin D, just to get out and reset this rhythm going. I would suggest that you don't drink coffee after or caffeine, caffeinated drinks, sorry, after about midday because it's got a half life of six hours. So actually, if we drink caffeine later in the day, that can impact people's ability to get to sleep and also sort of waking up throughout the night. Um, I would try and encourage adults to come up with a bedtime routine. Quite often when we have young children, we are very vigilant about giving them a very good bedtime routine. But there's actually no difference between children having a bedtime routine and us as adults. We need to wind our bodies and minds down. That might be taking a bath. That might be listening to some relaxing music or reading a book. Dimming your lights is a really good way to prepare your body for sleep. So don't have your main lights on in your living room or sort of be exposed to really bright lights. And that includes looking at sort of tablets and phones and laptops and computers late into the night because of the blue light that comes out. So try and stay off those devices at least an hour before you go to bed. And my last piece of advice to do with sleep is to charge your devices out of the bedroom. So make your bedroom this tech free zone. And I know lots of people use their phones as an alarm clock, but there's nothing stopping people spending £10 on an old traditional alarm clock, which then it removes that sort of um, pull to, oh, I meant to send this last email and oh, I meant to order that from Amazon or oh, I'll just check my Instagram feed one last time before I go to sleep. And before you know it, two hours later, you're still busy scrolling and doing tasks. So if you remove the temptation from your bedroom, then 
um, that just allows you to get to sleep and stay asleep for longer and better. Those are really good tips. Moving on to mindset, I'll give you a few mindset tips. So I try and encourage my um, clients to really focus on the positives and to try and control the controllables. So this is a term that gets banded around an awful lot. Um, But what that really means is focus your attention, your time, your energy on the things that you have control over. Because all the things that you don't have control over, if we're getting stressed and anxious about things that we can't change, we're using up valuable energy, valuable mindset and just health really on things that can't be influenced or changed at all. So it's really trying to focus on the things that you can control and make them as good as you can. And then just switching maybe a negative situation into a positive one. Um, I'll give you an example. So if you, for instance, got a parking ticket, that's really irritating. But at least if you get the parking ticket quickly and pay it quickly, you're going to be able to, you know, save a bit of money in that regard and you'll know never to park in that parking space again because you know the same will happen so instead of it being this big catastrophic event that oh I've got a parking ticket and all the stress and uh, worry that goes around that just write it off and go do you know what at least I've got it for half the price if I pay it within the next few you know few days so trying to switch that negative into a positive And my last piece of advice for exercise is just to move our bodies more, just to really consciously think about how much we are moving and how we like to move things that you enjoy. There's no point beating yourself up because you think you ought to be going for a run or joining a cycling club just because your friends are doing it or just because somebody's mentioned that really you should be doing it it's finding things that you enjoy it might be once COVID's over you know joining a trampoline club it might be joining an archery club it it could be anything but just try different things find things that you enjoy and mix it up because variety is the spice of life there's no point in just doing the same thing over and over again it's good to get a, a real mixed variety of things I I think. Yeah, I like that. I like all of those a lot, Claire. And I really appreciate you sharing them with us here on the on the show because I think what you do really, really well with the way you eloquently described all those different facets of, of holistic health is that none of it is mysterious, none of it needs to be complicated, none of it needs to be that expensive. It really is a question of deciding to pay attention to these things and then incorporating them into one's life. I like that a lot. So thank you for sharing those. Claire, I would like to switch gears with you slightly, if I may, because if I'm correct here, we obviously connected and met virtually uh, through social media. I believe it was LinkedIn in our case. And throughout these last 12 or 14 months that we've been in and out of lockdown, of course, More than ever, we now see that social media has the ability to be a small business owner's shop window, even if they don't have a physical shop. And I wonder if you could share with our small business owner listeners how you think about using social media in your business, um, not only to uh, make prospective customers aware of your brand and of your services, but also to keep in touch in this virtual world with existing customers as well. So a little while ago, I think it was in lockdown one, I did a social media course um, and it really helped me. It was um, just showed me the importance of it and the just lots of things about social media that were really very beneficial. I'm very mindful that I don't want to be one of those um, people or mothers that spends their whole time on social media. So I use social media in a as, as a format, as you've said, as a front a shop window or in an ability to follow up different things with people. So I think we're both members of the, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and what I often do is go to a networking meeting and make sure that I always connect with people because then they start seeing the posts that I put out. So I put out posts each week, oh, sorry, each day on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. I use it as a medium to let people know what I'm up to. I use it to put out ideas about health I put out ideas of what I'm up to to show people that actually as you've you've explained really nicely Amir that it's not hard to be healthy 
And actually, it is quite simple. It's just trying to eliminate the confusion of what is best for people, because there's such conflicting advice out there. All these diet books, all these websites saying, do this, do that, and you'll have a six pack or you'll lose three pounds or you know more than that. But it, there's such conflicting advice. But I try and use social media as one of my ways to communicate with people that it's not hard. It's just, as you've said, it is that choice. And it enables me to be able to show people actually how simple it is. Well, in my world, uh, the probably the greatest investor of all times, Warren Buffett, says something really interesting. He says, uh, you know, getting a hold of your own personal finances and sort of pursuing a successful investment journey is simple, but not easy. And I think that's where the services of a professional like yourself in your field, Claire, come in really, really handy and very valuable. It's simple stuff, but there's a lot of confusion out there. And just being able to avoid the confusion is already not easy. So uh, no, that's really well put. Claire, what are some of the key business lessons that you've learned throughout your life? So I think my, I've been given lots of advice. I think um, most business people probably have. But one of the best pieces of advice was to do something that you love. So when I was thinking about transitioning from being a teacher to a business owner, I was coming up with lots of different ideas. And somebody said to me, you'll be doing this every day. Make sure that you do something that you love and that you're passionate about. And I th- I'm hoping that that passion of mine about health really does come across because I just love to be able to help people and get help them get the most out of life. So that's sort of my number one piece of advice. Um, get out there as well. So put yourself out there, whether that be in terms of social media, um, in terms of meeting people in person, networking. If you're waiting for somebody to come and knock on your door, it's not going to happen, especially at the moment. In terms of you've got to let people know what you're doing, you've got to step outside of your comfort zone sometimes and put yourself maybe on a stage in front of people and say, hey, I'm going to talk to you today about X, Y, and Z. And it is But the more you do that, the easier it becomes. It's like any skill in life. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. And it's got all these benefits. And I just view that as letting people know, more and more people know that I focus on health. And I see that as, you know, that was a huge win. If I can reach some people and get them to prioritize their health, then I've done my job well today. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I very strongly second that. When you look back at your career journey to date, what are you most proud of? Gosh, so I'm most proud of building a company that suits my lifestyle. So already um, I move very frequently. I'm on house number 11 and it's really, really important for me to have a business that isn't location dependent. That's not to say I don't sort of pull on all the advantages um, location, but I need to be able to do what I do from wherever in the world. In fact, I started my coaching qualification on the thought that we were moving out to Washington, D.C., and I couldn't come back all the time to do my workshops. Obviously, COVID put a stop to that, but it's really just rocketed my or, you know, propelled my business into something that I would never have envisaged. Um, So to be able to get feedback from people to say, you're doing great. You're all over this, Claire. You have transformed my life. Um, Having feedback like that just makes all the hard work, all the research, all the learning how to do all the jobs that I don't particularly like, but do because I'm a small business owner. Um, It makes it worth it because I know that I'm helping people and I know that I'm helping them better their lives. And so that's probably the thing that I'm most proud of. That's fantastic. And what next for you and your business? Are there any projects in the pipeline that you can tell us about? Well, um, yes, I can actually. So I've, as I've sort of gone on this coaching career journey, I suppose, I started off by offering one-to-one coaching only. And I've realized that that's not everybody's cup of tea. So um, either financially or time or whatever that might be. So 
On the 24th of May, I'm actually launching my first ever group coaching program because some people work more dynamically. They get more out of working with other people as well. So this is called the Optimal Health Formula. So this is going to be a six-week program, which um, is going to be launched. And I'm really very excited about it. I've purposefully limited the numbers because I want to make it very personable and just really get to know my clients. But this is something that I'm hoping to repeat um, a few times a year. So that's the first thing that's in the pipeline. The second thing is a very, very new idea that I might, I'm, I've been thinking for a little while, I'd love to start a networking walking group. Now, I'm not sure that's quite the right direction for me. But I'm sort of coming up with an idea that I might start a, a health walk and talk, be healthy, come and join me for a walk and a chat to really try and encourage people to get outside, to move their bodies, to exercise their minds, to connect with people, reduce loneliness, have a decent conversation, which ticks all of the health boxes for me. So that's something that's very, very newly in the pipeline for me. So. Um, if you would like to find out about any of this, I'm sure you'll put my details in the show notes. Very much so. But it sounds like it's exciting times ahead. Oh, it's really exciting. There's never a dull moment in my life. <laughs> Very cool. As we start to wrap up, I'd like to ask you a few quick fire questions that our listeners are always interested in. So, Claire, what do you do to relax outside of the office? I love to cook. So, um, yeah, I'm often found in the kitchen or um, my husband does the sort of outdoor cooking, but I always do the typical accompaniments for those foods. Um, so cooking is one thing I love to do. And I love to run. Um, I've not always been able to. But as I said earlier, I see it as a real celebration of having a body that works for me. And I feel so blessed at the moment to have Richmond Park 600 metres away, the River Thames about the same distance away and just having the beauty on my doorstep that is. So I feel very, very lucky and fortunate to be in this position. Indeed. And are there any books that you've recently read that you'd recommend to our listeners? I love to read. I read an awful lot. And normally, well, I'm part of a book group. And so I've always got a fictional book on the go. Um, and then I'm always reading health related bits and pieces um but one book that really st has stood out for me recently is Matt Haig's The Midnight Library now I wasn't quite sure how this would turn out but it's all about um a lady who looks back at her life and she looks at how different decisions that she made would have changed her life dramatically. And it's all based around this main character. And she lives her life in a way that had she not made one decision at a crossroads and made the other, how her life would have dramatically changed. And it was a really interesting read. So um, I would highly recommend that to anybody. And that has now been recommended another couple of times, I think, in the show. So that is going on my to read list because every time I hear somebody describe that book to me, I think that sounds like a great story to get into. And yeah, for sure, it's going on to my uh, to read list. So I appreciate great. you sharing that, Claire. That's all um, right. I would say get over the first little bit because the first sort of, I don't know, third, not even third, the first few chapters are quite depressing or they could be perceived. And I know people who've been put off by that, but keep you know persevering and it will be worth it noted and are there any movies or tv shows that you've recently watched that you'd recommend to our listeners um recently i've been enjoying the ben fogel lives in the wild series i really like looking at how different people live their lives and sort of the motivations behind that and um ben goes into lots of different environments normally it's worldwide his recent one has just been in the uk because of covid but he joins people that have for whatever reason, removed themselves from, from mainstream society and it follows their lives and how they live um, in those in in different scenarios and in different parts of the world. And I actually saw Ben um, Fogel talk live in Harrogate um, not long before lockdown, actually. And I just think he's he's just a very personable person. And I think, yeah, I do enjoy watching him. That's really cool. And finally, where can people go to find out more about you and your business? 
So my main points of contact is my website, which is www.drme.uk. If people would like to ask me any questions, um, you can contact my email, which is claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at drme.uk. And my Facebook and Instagram is dr.me.health. And for the benefit of our listeners, I'll make sure that I add those links to the show notes. Claire, thank you for joining us here on the Inside Kingston podcast. It's been a pleasure getting to know your story. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for allowing me to tell my story. That wraps up another episode of the Inside Kingston podcast. Make sure to check out our guests' website, pay them a visit, and help spread the word about what they're doing. If you have any questions or know someone who should be a guest on the show, please feel free to get in touch. I would also love it if you could go to iTunes and leave us a review and a five-star rating. We work hard to bring on some great guests, and getting a review from you is one way to help the podcast rate well on iTunes so that others can find and enjoy the show too. Thanks for listening.